Hi, we're going to be talking about hypo and hyperglycemia and how to manage these conditions in the emergency department. We're going to start out by reviewing normal glucose metabolism. So normal glucose levels are between 60 and 150 milligrams per deciliter. It's important to remember that glucose is the primary energy source for our bodies. So we want to make sure that we're keeping it within this appropriate range. Now, where does glucose come from? So glucose comes from the foods that we eat. When we eat foods, our intestines absorb some of the glucose. Glucose also comes from gluconeogenesis, and gluconeogenesis is basically glucose that is made from precursors, such as lactate, pyruvate, and amino acids. Glucose for our body also comes from something called glycogenolysis, what this basically means is these are glucose stores that are getting broken down. Primarily the glycogen from our liver that's stored there for times that we're not able to eat gets broken down by the body and gets released into the bloodstream. Now we have a few primary regulatory hormones for glucose within our body. So one of them is insulin. And what insulin does is it leads to glucose storage. So basically, after that insulin, after the glucose that we eat gets absorbed from our body, insulin is secreted by the pancreas or released from the pancreas. And what that causes our body to do is it causes the body to store some of that glucose. Now, some of it is used immediately by our bodies, but some of it gets stored in the liver in the form of glycogen. The other primary regulatory hormone is glucagon. And glucagon leads to glucose release. So while insulin causes the pancreas uh, or causes the body to store the glucose, so to put it in storage and package it up, glucagon leads to breaking down of the glycogen and our bodies to release glucose. Now, these are both released in different times. Like I mentioned, insulin is released after one eats. Glucagon is released in time periods that you have longer times between meals or your body doesn't have enough glucose available to it, it will signal the body to release that glucose. You know, there are a couple of different diabetic states. We're gonna start here by talking about hyperglycemia. When we're thinking about hyperglycemia, we divide it into two different diabetic categories. So the first is type one. So what is type one diabetes? Type one is characterized by the acute absence of insulin. So this is our body not making insulin anymore. These people are prone to ketosis. We're gonna talk about diabetic ketoacidosis. And what this basically means is that our bodies, when they don't have insulin, will go ahead and break down other products, which will lead to ketone body formation. It's generally caused by autoimmune destruction of beta cells in the pancreas. So the beta cells are the cells of the pancreas that release the insulin. And our body is essentially responding to those and destroying them. These patients require parenteral insulin. These patients are gonna to need to be maintained on insulin because the key pathophysiologic process here is the fact that there is no insulin. Your body's not making it. Now this is distinguished from type two. Type two patients may remain asymptomatic for a long period of time. So they may not necessarily recognize that they're in a diabetic state. For these patients, insulin levels may actually be low, normal, or high. And a key tenant here is that they have an element of insulin resistance. So even if the insulin levels are normal or elevated, our tissues and the tissues in the body aren't responding to that. Now, ketosis here is rare. So these patients will more likely get HHS rather than getting diabetic ketoacidosis. There's also an association with obesity for these patients, as well as elevated triglyceride levels. Now, the rates of diabetic patients are on the rise. 9% of Americans have diabetes. And 12% of adults greater than 20 years old have diabetes as well. And these numbers are only increasing. The rates of childhood obesity are increasing. And this is a major public health crisis for the United States. There is also a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with diabetes. So diabetes predisposes patients to cardiovascular disease, to stroke, to renal failure, to problems with their vision. And all of this has major implications for patients as they get older, 
and as they develop these conditions. I always talk with patients who come in with elevated blood sugar about these complications because some of them, such as renal failure and eyesight, can potentially be prevented or staved off by good glucose control. I tell people, if you want to not go on dialysis, if you want to be able to see, you need to make sure that you're controlling your glucose well. You know, the presenting symptoms and clinical features of each of these conditions. So for type 1 diabetes, this is generally going to be a lean patient. This is going to be a patient who's going to be on the thinner side. Patients generally are younger, less than 40 years old, and generally the pediatric patients who present with hyperglycemia and diabetes, for the most part historically, have fallen into this category. However, now that we have increasing rates of childhood obesity, it's possible that the patients may commonly for, or may more often now fall into that type 2 category as kids. There's also poly, the classic polys, so polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria, and weight loss. So what these polys mean are that your patient is going to be drinking more, eating more, and urinating more. Generally, it's a rapid development of symptoms. So patients are well, and then all of a sudden, over a period of days or weeks, they start to feel really lousy. This decompensates to DKA. So when patients don't take their medication, when their body is under stress, diabetic ketoacidosis can develop. Type 2 diabetes, historically and classically, are thought to be most likely obese patients. It's important to remember, though, that not everyone who has this is overweight or obese, and 20% of the patients are not. Generally, again, older people, but with increasing rates of childhood obesity, this may present younger and younger for patients. It's also more of a gradual symptom onset, so patients are going to have potentially similar symptoms to the type 1 diabetic developing, so the polydipsia, the polyuria, but it's going to occur more gradually rather than taking that shorter period of time. This decompensates to HHS, which is a hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. So what are things that we want to do? Let's say a patient presents and they say, oh, I checked my blood sugar at my doctor's office, or I was concerned that I was having diabetes, so I checked my blood sugar using my husband, my friends, glucose monitor, and it comes back elevated. So they come to the emergency department seeking treatment. So one of the first things you want to do is you want to check their glucose levels. Are they elevated? And if so, to what extent? You want to check for urinary ketones. So on generally, on most urinalysis um, machines, urinary ketones will be detected. You want to check a venous blood gas is generally what we check. Here, we're more worried about the pH and the carbon dioxide level rather than checking the oxygen levels. So a venous blood gas is an adequate test here. And you want to check a chemistry panel. If you're worried about diabetic ketoacidosis, you want to start looking for and thinking about an underlying cause. So diabetic ketoacidosis occurs for a variety of reasons, but the underlying causes are potentially cardiac, possibly infectious. So if your patient is telling you things, like they're having chest pain or they've had fever, you want to check labs that will reflect that and do additional imaging studies potentially that will look for that. So for example, if a patient has a cough and a fever, you're going to want to get a chest x-ray. So when patients present with hyperglycemia, it could be a couple of things. So one is that it, the patient could have new onset diabetes or uncomplicated hyperglycemia. Uncomplicated hyperglycemia can occur if a patient hasn't been compliant with a diabetic diet or possibly if they haven't been compliant with taking their medications in a known diabetic patient. Diabetic ketoacidosis is generally for that type 1 diabetic patient, for the patient that has an absence of insulin. It can potentially develop in a type 2 diabetic patient, but it's more rare. And then lastly, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar states, more commonly in that type 2 diabetic patient, the patient with obesity. And we're going to be exploring these three conditions a little bit further. So for uncomplicated hyperglycemia, you want to make sure that you're ruling out ketosis or another one of the hyperglycemic states. In order to do that, you're going to send the appropriate lab work that was discussed. You're going to check the urine for ketones. You're going to possibly check a venous blood gas. If none of those are present, so if the patient does not have evidence of diabetic ketoacidosis, 
if you're not worried that they're having a hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state, you can go ahead and treat with IV fluids. You can consider administering insulin. Many of these patients with uncomplicated hyperglycemia are going to be maintained on oral medications, but they may also be on insulin, in which case you can consider giving them a dose of insulin. If someone is a new onset diabetic patient, you might also want to consider giving them insulin. For patients who have a new diagnosis of diabetes, metformin is a good initial choice for medication. The reason that we generally recommend metformin for patients is because it has a low rate of developing hypoglycemia. So metformin, based on the way it works and its mechanism of action, patients will rarely get too low of blood sugar, which is one of the big things that we want to avoid, especially if we're going to be discharging these patients. It's important to remember that from an emergency medicine perspective, we don't have a magic number for discharge of patients. So it's not like if the number uh, of the glucose gets less than 250, the patient can go home, or less than 300, or less than 400. This is going to vary based on attending uh, physician practice and how comfortable people feel, and also based on the patient. You want to make sure that your patient has close follow-up, though. So you want to make sure they have a doctor to follow up with who's going to be checking their blood sugar and their lab work and making sure that they're in an appropriate range. And you also want to try and get your patient diabetic diet teaching and resources. This is something that really could be a very big life-changing diagnosis for someone. So telling someone that they have new onset diabetes can have major implications for their life. They may have to totally change the way that they're eating. They might have to be started on medication. They may have to be started on insulin, which is like a shot in their abdomen. And sometimes patients aren't very excited about that. So keep that in mind when you're counseling these patients on discharge. Certain patients may be very plugged in with care. They may have a primary care doctor. Other patients may potentially even need to be admitted to the hospital to make sure that they're able to get these resources. Next, we're gonna talk about diabetic ketoacidosis. This slide has a lot of information on it and we're gonna go through it, but I want you to focus on what eventually is happening at the bottom of the slide. You know, here's the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what basically will happen is there's increased lipolysis and triglyceride breakdown. What that means basically is your body is digesting its fats. There's also decreased glucose uptake. So the body is gonna be taking up less glucose and there's increasing breaking down of proteins. So over here on this right side, the patient's gonna have increased free fatty acids, which in turn is gonna to lead to increased ketogenesis, so increased formation of ketones, which will in turn lead to acidosis. Now here in the center here, we see that increased free fatty acids is also gonna to lead to hyperglycemia, as will decrease glucose uptake. Hyperglycemia is gonna to lead to increased glucose in the urine, which will in turn lead to more urine production. So that's something that happens in the patients who present even with uncomplicated hyperglycemia. This is why patients have polyuria, increased urination when they're presenting with hyperglycemia. And this osmotic diuresis, this increasing loss of urine is gonna to lead to volume depletion and electrolyte loss as well. In turn, it may lead to impaired renal function, which can worsen acidosis. You're also gonna have increasing proteolysis, and that's gonna be increasing amounts of breaking down of the proteins, which is gonna to lead to increased amino acids and then increased gluconeogenesis. So basically then the body is gonna be making more glucose, new glucose, which will in turn lead to worsening hyperglycemia and increasing osmotic diuresis. So you could see that all of these things play off on each other. They all lead to hyperglycemia, they lead to volume loss and acidosis. Now, in addition to patients having polyuria and polydipsia and polyphagia, patients with DKA will also potentially have weakness. They may have blurry vision, nausea and vomiting, and abdominal pain. Abdominal pain is a very common presenting symptom in the pediatric patient. It's also important to remember that hyperglycemia can lead to recurrent infections, so thrush and candida, as well as balanitis, which is a penile infection. So keeping that in mind when you're evaluating patients with hyperglycemia, it can be helpful to ask if patients have had any kind of fungal infections.
On the physical exam, you're looking potentially your patient may have altered mental status. They may be confused. And that's due to the volume depletion, the acidosis, the renal failure. A classic thing is two small respirations. What this is, is it's a rapid, shallow breathing, almost like a dog panting after they've run a long distance is how I think about this. The reason that patients have two small respirations is because they're trying to breathe off some of the carbon dioxide. They're trying to breathe off the acidosis component. So they have this rapid, shallow breathing. You also might note an odor of acetone. Now, not everyone can smell this, and we'll get more to that in a moment, but there are some physicians who can walk past a room of a patient who's there with hyperglycemia and say, it smells like ketones. I'm not one of them, but there are a handful of people who can. And then hypotension and tachycardia. The patients may be low blood pressure, they may have elevated heart rate, and that's due to the diuresis and the volume depletion. Now about 30% of the population can smell acetone on someone's breath. Again, like I said, I'm not one of them, but if you are, consider yourself lucky. You'll have a great benefit when diagnosing patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now why do people get this? So new onset diabetes is the cause about one quarter of the time. So these are patients who have not yet been diagnosed with diabetes. Oftentimes this is in a pediatric patient or a younger patient who's presenting. You always want to be thinking about other underlying causes or reasons because DKA is commonly caused by something else. Infection or sepsis is a common one. So when you have patients coming in with DKA, you can't just stop there and say, oh, it's DKA, we're done. You have to be thinking about what could potentially be causing it. Cardiac causes are another. Myocardial ischemia can definitely lead to DKA. There are also emotional stressors. So patients who are under a lot of you know, financial, legal, family stress can lead to this. And then medication noncompliance. Patients all the time decide not to take their medication for various reasons. They can't afford their medicine. This is common in like a female teenage patient who recognizes that if she doesn't take her medication, she can actually lose weight. So this is not uncommon for that specific patient population that they don't take their medication. So medication noncompliance is a big one. I've taken care of patients multiple times who present with the exact same complaint with DKA or the exact same diagnosis mainly because they just didn't take their medicine. So thinking about the diagnosis, D stands for diabetes. So what this means is that you're gonna have an elevated blood sugar. Generally, it's greater than, than 350 milligrams per deciliter, but you can also have this concept of euglycemic DKA, which is when you have DKA where the blood sugar is less than 300. K stands for ketosis. So the body is forming ketones. And A stands for acidosis. Now this is an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So this falls into the differential for anion gap metabolic acidosis. You probably remember the mnemonic mud piles. So M stands for methanol, U, uremia, D for DKA. And we can go through the rest of the mnemonic at another time. So D is our DKA component here. Uh, for these patients, a chemistry and a venous blood gas will help diagnose that acidosis component. So you're looking for a low pH on your venous blood gas, and on your chemistry, you're looking for a low bicarbonate level. These patients are acidotic. Now for DKA, arterial and venous blood gas pH measurements correlate very, very closely. So the only reason that you would need to get an arterial blood gas would be if you were concerned about oxygenation or some kind of respiratory issue. But for the most part, a venous blood gas will be an appropriate and adequate test when you're worried about the acidosis. Now it's important that we take a moment to think about some electrolyte issues that we're gonna see in DKA. So the first is sodium. Patients with DKA and with hyperglycemia in general can get something called pseudohyponatremia. What this basically means is that the sodium level actually is okay in the blood, but what's being reflected in the labs is inaccurate. So we can do a calculation to correct for this phenomenon. And the calculation is that you add 1.6 milliequivalents per liter to the sodium value on the lab report for every 100 milligrams of per deciliter of glucose that are above the norm. So what you're doing is you're correcting your sodium level. Next, potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus. 
Now, it's important to remember that overall, you're going to have total body depletion of these electrolytes. So your body is actually going to be depleted of them, but the level may be normal or elevated. One of the big reasons for potassium is that on the cells, there's a potassium hydrogen exchange channel. And what happens when the hydrogen ions are high, as in a state of acidosis, the potassium is gonna go into the cell, or out of the cell rather, and the hydrogen ion is gonna go into the cell. So the potassium is gonna come out, hydrogen ion in. So even if your body is low in potassium, it's gonna be reflected in the extracellular environment that the potassium may be normal or high. The other thing you can get to screen for these electrolyte issues is an EKG. So if you're worried about it, uh, an initial test for DKA to help evaluate for electrolytes and electrolyte abnormalities would be an EKG. We'll be talking more about the EKG changes associated with potassium issues in another lecture.